Good afternoon. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Bureau of Justice Assistance at the Department of Justice and the National Reentry Resource Center at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Thank you for joining us. Before we begin, I have a couple of technical notes. If you encounter connection or audio problems during this webinar, please call WebEx Technical Support at 866-229-3239. We will also include that number on the chat box on your screen. Unfortunately, there are some connection issues we may not be able to resolve during the webinar. However, we are recording today's webinar and everyone who registered for it will receive an email as soon as it is available on our website at csgjusticecenter.org forward slash NRRC. We should have the webinar posted online within the next two weeks. At the end of today's webinar, we will have a few minutes for questions and answers from the audience. All lines are muted except for the presenters. To ask a question, please enter it in the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. You can ask questions at any point during the webinar, and we will do our best to answer as many as possible before we end at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time today. So welcome, my name is Lakees Tavares and I am a policy analyst and technical assistance provider at the National Reentry Resource Center, which provides training and technical assistance to all grantees funded under the Federal Second Chance Act. Also joining us today are David Diamora, Director of Special Projects and Senior Advisor for the CSG Justice Center, Dr. Robin Wilson from Wilson Psychological Services and McAster University, in Ontario, Canada. We also have Derek Miodofnik um, from the Vermont Department of Corrections, as well as Laura Zelliger and Chris Barton. Thank you all very much for taking the time from your busy schedules to join us today. Let's take a look at what we will cover in this webinar. When returning home from incarceration, people convicted of sexual offenses face many obstacles that prevent them from securing housing and accessing employment and educational opportunities. These obstacles are also often compounded by additional barriers, including limited access to pro-social activities and restrictions on reuniting with family, among others. The Circles of Support and Accountability model focuses on the safe reintegration of people returning home from incarceration through community involvement and collaboration. Today, presenters will provide an overview of the COSA model and describe what implementation looks like across the country. Review Vermont's COSA model um, for the Vermont DOC, which has seen effective results in community reintegration and recidivism reduction, and discuss how evidence-based programming can help improve outcomes and better integrate people with sexual offense convictions into the broader reentry strategies. So to provide a little bit of background, the Justice Center is a national nonprofit organization that serves policymakers at the local, state, and federal levels from all branches of government. Staff provides practical, nonpartisan advice and evidence-based consensus-driven strategies to increase public safety and strengthen communities. The National Reentry Resource Center, which is funded by the Bureau of Justice Assistance and managed by us here at the Justice Center, provides technical assistance for Second Chance Act grant recipients and support to SCA grantees and the broader field. We are constantly adding new content and resources to our website, and we send out a monthly newsletter that provides information about the latest research, funding opportunities, distance learning events, and other news about reentry. To sign up for the newsletter, please visit the link on your screen after today's webinar. Our first presenter is Dr. Robin Wilson. Dr. Wilson is a researcher, educator, and board certified clinical psychologist who has worked with people with sexual and social behavior problems in hospital, correctional, and private practice settings for more than 30 years. 
He has worked in corrections in Canada, sexual offender civil commitment in Florida, and has provided consultation on assessment, treatment, and risk management to state, provincial, national, and international stakeholder groups. Dr. Wilson has published hundreds of scientific articles, book chapters, and other monographs, and has presented internationally on the diagnosis and treatment of social and sexual psychopathology. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wilson to introduce the circles of support and accountability. Okay, thank you very much. It's uh, certainly a great honor to be uh, involved in this today with such a, you know, such an esteemed panel of guests. Uh, and looking up at the top here, it says we currently have 261 participants. So I welcome all of you, and um, I hope that we will be able to provide you with a very informative session this afternoon. So what I'd like to do in my part here is to uh, spend a little bit of time introducing the circles of support and accountability model. For those of you who may be somewhat unfamiliar with that, give a little bit of the background. Um, and I'm also going to review some of the, the current research findings, or at least the, uh, some of the research findings that we have so far. I know that my friends from Vermont will speak about some, uh, some of the other findings as well, but I'm going to stick pretty much to the, uh, um, to the recidivism data uh, findings such as they are at the moment. The first thing I'd like to do, though, is to spend a couple of minutes um, just sort of introducing the model. And, uh, you know, I've given, you know, many dozens of these talks across the world, and uh, you know, up till about halfway through, part of my difficulty was that I never bothered to tell people what the model was until probably about an hour or so, in, an hour or so into the presentation. So let's, let's cut to the chase and tell you what, what we're talking about. So essentially, this is the model. Um, and it's two concentric circles, the inner circle of which is comprised of a core member. That's the fellow in the sort of yellowish orange there. And he is the released offender. Um, in his circle with him are anywhere from three to five volunteers from the community. These volunteers have been, uh, um, have been, been specially trained. They have been, uh, they have been vetted to make sure that they're there for the right reason and that they're not going to make things worse. Um, and the training they receive, of course, is not to the extent uh, that would render them as pseudo-psychologists or you know, kind of de facto social workers or anything like that. What we do, essentially, is to inform them about what it is to be um, a knowledgeable citizen about risk posed by certain types of people. In this case, someone who's returning to the community after incarceration for a uh, sexual offense of, of some sort. So in that, that inner circle, we have the core member and we have the volunteers that he is working with, um, and they do the bulk of the work in ACOSA. In the outer circle, um, we have a number of different professionals. So these are, uh, these are probation officers, psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, um, other people who have expert knowledge around sex offender risk management. And the purpose of that, that outer circle is to provide support to the inner circle. There are certainly some things in the inner circle that we would expect those volunteers to address with the core member on their own, things like if he needs to uh, you know, have some assistance with going and getting his, his social security card, or if he needs to, to know where to go to, to get his driver's license renewed, or if he needs some assistance making good choices about where to buy groceries, those sorts of things, we would expect the inner circle to be able to manage on their own. But if he were to show up at one of his circle meetings and say, uh, there's a cute little girl who moved in next door and I'm fantasizing like crazy about her, we don't want the circle to manage that beyond being, uh, being knowledgeable that they need to reach out to the outer circle and uh, speak to someone who has expert knowledge about what to do with those fantasies how that, that, uh, you know, that particular scenario should be managed. Now, there's another important person in this mix here, and that's the purple woman just off to the left there. Um, and that person is a paid, uh, paid circle project coordinator, and it is her job, or if it happens to be a guy, it's his job, to make sure that the inner circle is functioning the way it ought to, and that when they have questions that they're going to ask of the outer circle, that the outer circle indeed does respond to them. 
So that person is there to, to ensure that the inner circle functions appropriately um, and to be able to provide support, but also to make sure that when there is a need for some expert assistance, that that outer circle of, of you know, experts is also there to respond. So that's the model. Um, a couple of things that I want to talk about before we go too far into this is there's, there often tends to be a lot of sort of misinformation about sexual offending as an issue. Um, and I think some of the, the sort of uh, key points around sexual offending such as we know it today uh, I think really do point us towards in interventions like COSA. So let's speak a little bit about this. So what we know about sexual offending is that the vast majority of offenders are male. So for the most part, I'm going to be using the you know, sort of male pronouns today, and I'm going to speak about core members as being him or, or his or, you know, he, that sort of thing. That's not to say that there aren't some circles out there with female, with female participants, but generally speaking, we tend to be uh, seeing COSAs largely as a male, male sort of thing. Um, and that's because the vast majority of the sexual offenders we know of are also male. One of the things a lot of people don't realize is that the largest age cohort of people who sexually offend is actually boys in that age range of about 13 to 15, which is when, of course, we have the big P happening. So those boys are going through the processes of change associated with puberty, and what often happens is that they have a lot of sexual energy and a lot of new sexual thoughts and feelings and urges that they frankly don't have the prefrontal cortex development to know what to do with. So we find them making a lot of ill-advised choices, um, uh, you know, sometimes uh, you know, engaging in some sexual experimentation with their peers or with other, uh, with other younger children. Um, and this is, you know, sort of relatively common. I mean, not not sort of everyday sort of thing, but we do see a fair bit of offending behavior in boys of this age. Um, the key thing to remember, however, is that the research is really clear. Most boys who offend in this age range will not go on to sexually reoffend as adults. And, and the most recent meta-analysis that I saw suggests that about 97% of boys who sexually offend prior to age 18 will not sexually offend post age 18. Um, so. Uh, so the key point, I guess, here is, is to remember that, that for all intents and purposes, juvenile offenders seem to be quite different. One of the other things that recent research has, has helped us to see is that people who sexually offend have, have quite a bit of adverse childhood experience. In fact, more so than their non-sex offending criminal peers, and certainly much more so than the general public. Um, and what this means is that they have complex needs. Um, which points to the, the need for us to think of our sex offending clients as people who, who are unlikely to be only having difficulties with respect to sexuality. They're probably likely to see some, different, some, some difficulties in other areas as well. With respect to this issue of how many people are likely to reoffend, we know that, uh, you know, if we sort of look at the opposite direction of it, about 95% of the people who are coming into the system are first time caught. And we see this from research um, in a number of places in the United States and also in Canada as well. Reoffense rates are lower than most people think. Um, the, the, the big, big Hansen, Hansen and Morton, Morton Bergon meta analysis from 2004 suggested that somewhere in the neighborhood of about 15% of, of, of known sexual offenders will reoffend. Will reoffend in five to seven years post-release. Um, I would suggest that those numbers are now a little bit dated. Most, most Canadian and U.S. jurisdictions are now reporting rates that are even lower than that. And, uh, you know, certainly David Finkelhor from the University of New Hampshire has shown, I think, fairly conclusively that rates of both sexual offending and sexual reoffending have been on a steady decline for about the last three decades. Um, at this point, uh, there are many states that are reporting rates uh, of sexual reoffending of 10% or less over a period of 10 years of follow-up. Um, and indeed, one of the things we see is that at this point, most identified sexual offenders who go back to prison are going back to prison because of a technical violation more often than because they're engaging in a new, new, a new crime, and especially uh, with respect to any new sexual crime. 
Um, and again, this I think reiterates that our client population have these, these complex needs, that they're finding themselves getting into trouble, not necessarily for things that are specifically sexually related. So, you know, I think the bottom line of these two slides is to say that initiatives like COSA are there specifically to help address these complex needs. And I think by the end of this session, you'll get a sense of just exactly how the wraparound care model that we're talking about here really does promote a lot of, uh, uh, you know, happy outcomes for people who have previously uh, been, you know, part of that in prison, out of prison, back in prison, back out of prison kind of uh, merry-go-round sort of scenario. So let's talk a little bit about where this all came from. So in the summer of 1994, this fellow here, his name is Charlie, he was released from a medium security penitentiary just outside of the city of Toronto. He was judged to be at high risk to reoffend. Um, this is prior to the to the static 99. This is uh, his risk was gauged using a very early version of the VRAG known as the violence protection, sorry, the violence prediction scheme. Um, and his risk to reoffend was gauged at that point as being 100% chance of reoffending within seven years. Um, he was released at the very end of his sentence because the National Parole Board in Canada had decided that his risk was so high that he needed to be detained until the very last day of his sentence. Okay. What that meant was that he was then sent back to the community with no strings attached, no probation officer, no parole officer, and most importantly, no link to any social service agency that could potentially help him to stay offense free. Um, and indeed, when we were trying to find ways to link them up with some of our usual community partners, many of them said, you know, hey, we're happy to work with you on, on those cases that still have some time um, or those people whose risk is, you know, kind of manageable. But in this case, we see this guy as a time bomb. We don't know what to do with him and sorry, can't help you. So basically everyone said, we have nothing to give this guy. And essentially he was being released to the community with, with no, uh, with no accountability framework and no support, and that was something untenable. Um, fortunately for us, there's this fellow here, the Reverend Harry Nye, who was the pastor of an, of an, urban, um, an urban Mennonite church. And essentially what Harry is now famous for having done is when everyone else said send him elsewhere, what Harry said was send him here. And when his church elders found out about what he intended to do, um, they also showed the same level of courage and said, oh, no, you don't, not without us. And that was essentially the first circle. What we, in terms of, of trying to figure out where this all came from, um, in Canada, with respect to restorative justice, we know that we have a lot of influence from our native Canadian populations. Um, um, I think this picture is actually from some, from some Native Americans, but, but uh, you know, they're our friends as well, so I'm using this graphic. But the idea of sitting in a circle where everyone is more or less equal, being able to have the opportunity to speak and to have some influence on how things turn out um, in you know, the local community, I think is an important part of of our ancestral uh, ways of doing things. And indeed, the circle motif, I think, is very important for our species. Um, this monument goes back some eight, eight or 9,000 years, certainly well predates the pyramids. Um, you know, of course, it didn't always look like this. Um, and the very earliest parts of it were, were you know, sort of wooden circles. But the idea is that there's strength in a circle. There's power in that, that you know, sort of circular structure. We're all familiar with King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, and here we see uh, you, know, you know, a sort of relatively old um, depiction of that. This, I think, is 13th century or so. This is in the city of Winchester, uh, which would have been not terribly far away from where Arthur and his, his uh, folks would have hung out if indeed that, that legend has some truth to it. But again, we have this idea of an individual sitting across the table with his peers, you know, sort of all around the table with him, everyone having an opportunity to see one another and to be able to speak to one another with some, with some relative ease. Um, even E.T. thinks that circles are important. 
So I bring you back to our model, and just to refresh your memory, we have the inner circle with the core member and his trained volunteers who work with one another to, uh, to enhance the life of the core member. Um, and I think uh, you also see some, hands, some enhancement of life for the, for the volunteers as well in that they get a, an opportunity to speak about things with other people and you know, from time to time the core member is also quite informative. Um, the outer circle comprise of those experts, those, those psychologists, uh, the POs, law enforcement, um, you know, people with expert knowledge about what to do in sex offender risk management. And of course that last person, the person who ensures that everything functions the way that it's supposed to, that's our circle coordinator. With respect to COSA, um, and this is the mission, mission statement from the Canadian projects, although I think it's been adopted by and large by most other projects worldwide. But the idea here is that we're trying to substantially reduce the risk of future sexual victimization of community members by, excuse me, by assisting and supporting release men in their task of integrating with the community and leading responsible, productive, and accountable lives. And I just take you for a moment to this word integrating that's in that third last line. And we pointedly chose not to say reintegrating because we're mindful of the fact that many of the men who find themselves in circles come from such dire backgrounds, such, such horrific uh, you know, kind of developmental periods that in some respects, it's questionable whether or not they were ever integrated in the first place. So we're in the process of not reintegrating many of these men, but actually integrating them. In terms of of our core principles, we believe that no one is disposable, that, that everybody has a place in the community if they're willing to do their part, that no one does this alone. We're uh, you know, sort of stronger together, to coin a phrase, I suppose. Um, it's it's uh, you know, a long-held uh, thing that, that people who are socially isolated tend not to do as well, and especially when they've engaged in behavior that's put them at, at odds with the law. So we want to make sure that, that people have the opportunity to have support and some, uh, some feedback, some accountability. We believe in no more victims. We're not Pollyanna about this. We realize that this, is a, that this is a very difficult task. When we say no more victims, we're talking about the individual core member who's in front of us at the moment. And that's pretty much the major pledge that we ask them for, that they will do everything in their power to make sure that they create no more victims. And this last bit I think is also quite important. We recognize that the community is responsible for both its victims and those who offend against them. That if we're truly going to have a safer society, we have to address all of the people who are involved in this, this unfortunate dynamic. So why do circles work? If we think about the risk need responsivity model, essentially the who to target for intervention, what to target for intervention and how to target for intervention. Um, it would be my perspective that the CIRCLES model is fully R&R compliant. We have, have tended to target those who pose moderate high to high risk to reoffend. So we're uh, you know, making sure that people who have those high risk and need uh, profiles are the ones who are most likely to get a CIRCLE. Those people who really have no great amount of social support external to what they would get from a circle. In terms of the need principle, we're working specifically with them in terms of dealing with those lifestyle management issues that are ultimately going to make or break their success in the community. And the last bit there I think is where the circle really I think is able to do its best work is in the how we target our, uh, um, our core members. And it's through, through that sort of frank dialogue, um, you know, talking about life, talking about choices one makes, you know, the sort of choices one makes in life, um, essentially trying to ensure that there is an opportunity for our core members to succeed. And it's through that, that social engagement that I think that, you know, I think really that's the spark that drives COSA. In terms of some of the reoffense data, there are four, four published studies at this point. Um, and just as I was pulling these up, I noticed that there are a couple of little doodads on these slides that might need to might need to be corrected before we put them up on the uh, um, before we put them up on the CSG website. But I, I will attend to that. Basically, what we need to look at here is 
these are uh, these first two slides are of a match comparison design. So we have 60 guys who've got a circle, 60 guys who are essentially the same, um, you know, matched on a number of different variables. Uh, with hopefully the major difference between these two groups being that one group got a circle and the other did not. In terms of rates of sexual reoffending, we see about a 70% reduction um, for those people who are who are in a circle versus those who are not. Um, and I think that's the you know kind of the major takeaway here. The other bits uh, in those last few lines under uh, um, under recidivism, um, I think give you some sense of, of the differences in terms of how many people um, are reoffending in the circle group versus the non-circle group. And in every case, we see less in those, that group of people who are in a circle. So this is the, um, the Ontario pilot sample. This is the first group of people with Charlie having been the original member of this group. Uh, a couple of years later, we decided to look to see whether or not this COSA model that was being used in South Central Ontario could be uh, planted or seeded in other places across Canada. And this is a follow-up study looking at all of the circle projects in Canada with the exception of the South Central Ontario project. So here we have, again, a match comparison design study. We've got 44 people who got a circle, 44 match controls, and there's a, a approximately 83% reduction in rates of sexual reoffending. Um, so I guess that's the important takeaway message here. If you look at that very last line there, the total number of both convictions and charges, you can see that there's quite an awful lot of reoffending, you know, sort of across the board happening in the control sample uh, as compared to the circle sample. So it's somewhere in the neighborhood of about one quarter um, of the reoffense rates in the circles group as compared to the control. On the strength of the research that was done in Canada, um, or at least some of the earlier uh, you know, sorts of forays into the research aspect of this, um, our compatriots in the UK um, decided that they also wanted to take a look at whether or not the COSA model could assist them in their work with higher risk, uh, with higher risk and higher need sexual offenders returning to the community. Um, a, a panel of uh, five people from Canada including myself and four others, went over in 2000, had some discussions with the Home Office, and were able to help, I think, seed circles um, in the UK. They now have a national charity called, uh, not surprisingly, Circles UK. And um, these are data from the Circle Southeast, Circle Southeast Project. So this would be basically Hampshire and Thames Valley, uh, located roughly in and around the sort of London area of the country. And here again, we have a match comparison design. And what we see is a 75% reduction in the rate of either contact sexual or, or violent reconviction or non-contact non sexual reconviction. So essentially adding the zero and the three to make three, adding the 10 and the two to make 12, and we have a 75% reduction. Um, so the findings in and around the same magnitude as what we saw in Canada. So now what we know is that this isn't just South Central Ontario, it's not just Canada, but it can be replicated in the UK as well. Of course, here in the US, we don't believe that anything is real or that anything actually happened until we've done it ourselves. Um, and I say that with some, you know, with some tongue in cheek and I hope people out there are laughing, um, not intending to besmirch my new friends here in the United States. Um, Grant Dewey from from the Minnesota Department of Corrections, did this interesting study uh, some four years ago. Uh, and this is the first US outcome study. Uh, and in this, because of the nature of the project in the state of Minnesota, they were able to use a randomized controlled trial in which 31 uh, members of circles were, uh, were randomly selected and 31 persons were randomly selected to go into a control sample. The follow-up time is too short to show differences with respect to sexual offending, although it's notable that the one person who did sexually reoffend was from the control sample. What Grant and his crew were, however, able to show was that there were significant reductions in hazard ratios for three of five, three of five outcome indicators that are related to problems in the community, although not specifically to, uh, to sexual reoffending. And what we saw were 62% fewer rearrests. 72% fewer 
fewer technical violation revocations, and 84% fewer uh, incarceration, sorry, reincarceration for any reason. Um, I had a chat with my friends from Minnesota at the recent ATSA conference, and I'm told that they now have a sample size that is, uh, that is around 50, that has, uh, a, a, has a sufficient um, outcome period that they should be able to report within the next year and that the results are in the same direction as what we've seen in these other studies. Uh, the last thing I'll note is that Grant and his crew were also able to give us a cost-benefit analysis showing essentially that for every dollar spent on COSA in the state of Minnesota, they were getting $1.82 back in terms of savings, which uh, translates essentially to safety in the community. The last study that I want to talk about is one that's a little bit preliminary at the moment, uh, preliminary at the moment, and this is one that is being undertaken uh, by Kathy Fox, uh, myself, and others in the state of Vermont. And uh, you know, these numbers that I'm showing you here will likely change slightly. We're just going through our data and making sure everything's proper um, before we send it off to be published. But what you can see here is that in each of these different colors, there are significant differences in rates of reoffending for um, uh, people who are either sexual offenders, non-sexual violent offenders, or offenders in general. Um, and I should note that these groups are exclusive. So uh, all the people who are in the green uh, would not also be found in the blue or the gray. And what we see are, are some fairly uh, significant uh, differences in the rates of reoffending in these three groups. We have to break it down a little bit more and do a little more analysis. But the interesting thing here is that this is the first time that I know of where we've got some data that shows that the COSA model works uh, as, you know, works well not just with the sex offender population, but also with a, a general violent population and a nonviolent, non sexual offender population. So I think that's encouraging, and we hope to have some of these data out in the next, uh, in the next few months. So just to recap what we see here, so we've got five evaluations of the COSA model, two from Canada, one from the UK, and two from the United States. All the studies show the same basic findings, that COSAs can contribute to lower reoffending and better community reintegration or integration, whichever word you prefer. However, I think it's really fair and probably important to note that so far these are but five studies with relatively small sample sizes and relatively short follow-up. Clearly, more research is needed, um, you know, for my own sake. Um, I think the encouraging thing here is that we've got, we've got multiple jurisdictions internationally, all of whom are, are experiencing uh, findings at or about the same, same magnitude. So I think this is encouraging for those of us who are invested in the COSA model. Never doubt that a group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. This is a quote, of course, from the great Margaret Mead. And I think that, uh, that this is essentially what COSA is trying to do, involve the greater community um, in small groups to make uh, rather important changes with respect to safety for their peers, but also for, for giving offenders a shot at perhaps building that balanced and self-determined lifestyle that we all know is incongruous with further offending behavior. And with that, I will sign off for myself. These are my contact details. I'm more than happy to respond to emails. Uh, if you want to read some of the Circle's research that I've published, there is a tab for that on my website, which is listed here also. And I'm going to pass it on to my Vermont friends. And here we go. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. Um, to share stories from the community, we now have Derek Miodovnik, Laura Zelliger, and Chris Barton for the Department of Corrections in Vermont. Under the Community, at, sorry, under the Community and Restorative Justice Unit, um, the team oversees the state's extensive network of partnerships with the community justice centers and transitional housing providers. Um, through the work of Derek, Laura, and Chris, the Vermont Circles of Support and Accountability Program has grown into a nationally leading model. I will now turn it over to Vermont DOC to discuss implementation of COSA in the state of Vermont. Thank you, Lahid. This is Chris Barton, uh, Vermont Department of Corrections. 
and I'll run us through the first slides and then turn it over to Laura and then she will in turn turn it over to Derek. So um, you'll see a number of similarities between uh, the Vermont model and the Canadian model um, uh, that Robin presented and uh, I'll share some of those similarities and differences through the first part of this presentation. Uh, in Vermont, we generally have three trained and supervised volunteers uh, on our COSAs uh, that provide a structured voluntary and mutual relationship um, with individuals re-entering the community after incarceration. As Robin mentioned, we refer to that person as the core member. Uh, as also uh, Robin presented, uh, our primary target is sex offenders in Vermont, uh, but we have, we offer COSA uh, to other groups as well. Uh, COSAs are developed and operated uh, by our local community justice centers. We have a network of 20 community justice centers throughout the state of Vermont, and those are locally based justice centers uh, that provide uh, this optional enhancement uh, through COSA uh, to uh, the normal correctional supervision. Uh, as I mentioned, our core members are high risk and or high need individuals. Um, willing to commit to the COSA process as part of their supervision, uh, commit to at least one year. Um, in some instances, our COSAs are accompanied uh, by housing. Some of our community justice centers provide transitional housing, uh, as well as some of our other transitional housing partners uh, partner with our community justice center uh, to provide COSA to folks in, in that transitional housing. So some have housing attached to them and, and many do not. Uh, the primary target population are those who have committed sexual offenses, uh, but we, we have that open to all offenders that are high risk uh, and or high need. Uh, we try to convene our COSAs prior uh, to release date. Um, we, we target about 90 days out, ideally. Uh, we usually have the first meeting of the COSA team inside the correctional facility, um, and then it extends out into the community. Uh, they meet formally uh, for one year weekly, uh, but many of our COSAs extend uh, far beyond that one year mark. In fact, most of them extend beyond the year. Uh, in addition to that formal meeting, um, uh, of the entire COSA team, our COSA volunteers usually will meet with the core member outside uh, for coffee or uh, some approved rec recreational activity or uh, some other leisure activity with that core member. They also usually are available by phone and text uh, so our core members can, can communicate throughout the week, not just at that uh, weekly meeting. Uh, our core members are faced, especially our sex offender core members, but all of our uh, core members are faced with the prospect of uh, building a community life um, after a significant period of incarceration. Uh, many of them have lost their positive social networks. Uh, if they had them to begin with, uh, they face the challenge of finding housing, finding employment, um, all those different uh, endemic uh, realities of reentering. Our CJCs, our community justice centers, um, each one has a COSA coordinator who facilitates the program. Uh, they supervise the volunteers, they schedule the meetings, they communicate with PNP, uh, they keep that communication line open with the volunteers and they play that uh, liaison role between uh, probation and parole and the circle as well as uh, between, probation, uh, between the circle and other uh, treatment providers and other uh, folks in the community. Uh, similar to uh, the model that Robin presented, every six to eight weeks uh, we have a larger meeting which includes the core member, uh, the COSA team, which is the COSA coordinator and volunteers. Uh, the probation officer is usually there, family or other support in the core member's life will attend that meeting. Uh, service providers or treatment providers sometimes will attend those meetings. Uh, for a comprehensive and integrated picture of the progress, challenges, and responsive planning. Um, uh, it, it keeps that uh, notion of no secrets alive when there's regular communication with all those that are involved. Uh, 
Uh, the ultimate goal of COSA, as Robin mentioned, was, is no more victims. Uh, this model uh, that Robin presented uh, that you see here, uh, in Vermont it's actually uh, slightly different uh, in that that, that purple uh, co circle coordinator actually sits in the circle. So they're in the circle meetings when we have the meetings. We usually have uh, three trained volunteers, the core member, the circle coordinator, uh, sitting in, in those meetings. And then that circle coordinator also provides that liaison role. Uh, with the professionals and those in that outer circle. Uh, in 2003, Vermont began to explore uh, using restorative justice principles uh, with those that were re-entering the community uh, from incarceration were, was awarded a federal uh, grant um, to begin that process. A few models were looked at and in 2005, uh, the model uh, chosen uh, by uh, Vermont DOC and our community justice centers in collaboration was the Circle of Support and Accountability model. Uh, a number of uh, folks uh, from our community justice network, uh, as well as DOC, went up to Canada, went up to Toronto uh, to look at the model uh, and get trained in the model and bring that model uh, down to Vermont. So, we started running COSAs in 2005 with about six in that initial year, and it's continued to grow uh, from there. In 2010, a Vermont Department of Corrections was awarded a Second Chance Act grant uh, to implement 24 COSA and do some evaluation uh, on the model. And then in 2012, that uh, Second Chance Act grant was renewed, uh, offering a, an additional 24 COSA. So we were funded to do 48, but actually uh, some of our sites use that funding were able to do uh, even more than that. I think we finished um, with, with closer to 60 than 48 uh, from that initial funding. Uh, in 2013, uh, the DOC was awarded a new Second Chance Act grant, uh, which focused on the COSA model as the centerpiece, but added four other uh, reintegrative or integrative services, depending on uh, the level of connection our core members or reentering folks had. Uh, one was uh, reentry or resource navigation, uh, reintegration panels, which uses some of the same COSA models, but is a less intensive, um, uh, shorter duration process uh, as COSA, uh, family group conferencing, and educational workshops. Um, 2016, uh, we had 47 new COSAs started. Uh, 81 COSAs were active at the end of the fiscal year. And over the course uh, of the last decade, uh, we've run over 280, and actually that number now is uh, over 300 COSAs that we've started uh, in Vermont. This time I'm gonna turn uh, the presentation over to Laura Zelliger. Thanks, Chris. Uh, happy to join everyone here today and uh, would like to uh, talk a little bit about the evaluations, not so much from the recidivism reduction point of view, but from um, a little bit about that, but also from what it means for the people who have actually engaged in circles of support and accountability, whether it's uh, core members or volunteers. And I think uh, I'm happy to have the chance here to give voice to that population. So to wrap up sort of where the research is, and it's extremely important, so I don't want to gloss over it, I do want to give mention to some other research that's been done in the state of Vermont on some of our broader community and restorative justice programs. Chris noted that in Vermont we have 20 community justice centers, and those were really anchored in the development of what we would call reparative probation. So over a number of years, engaging the community uh, to actively engage citizen partners to be involved in uh, helping hold offenders accountable and restoring harm to victims. So over the period of, is it 20, we've been doing that for more than 20 years now, actually closer to 30, I believe. And in 2007, we had um, an empirical study of our reparative probation program that showed a 23% reduction in recidivism. And those are some of our lower level um, misdemeanor type cases that involve community in uh, developing 
reparative agreements between offenders and the community. Uh, as we jumped up and as Chris talked about, we moved into doing COSA work in the mid-2000s and have been doing it since then. And in 2013, we're the recipient of a site COSA evaluability study. So Ian Elliott uh, came up and looked at the Fidelity to model, the Fidelity to the COSA model. And, and in that study, Vermont COSA had the greatest program fidelity. And the, you're um, able to access, I think, those reports. I don't know if we have the link here, but we can be sure that you get it. And then even more uh, important, or not more important, equally important, is that we were able to engage Dr. Kathy Fox out of the University of Vermont, who you heard Robin mention, uh, in, initiate a qualitative evaluation of the COSA program. So to date, the other research had really focused on the number side of things, and Kathy went out and over the course of three years uh, conducted extensive interviews and really learned about what is the impact of the COSA program having on the individuals involved, and we're in a, a great place where we can hear, learn from that. So what the, in a nutshell, what that study looked like is uh, Dr. Fox interviewed 21 core members, 59 volunteers, and nine COSA coordinators, and those are the the folks that Chris was referencing in the walk between, walk with the inner circle and then also connect with the outer circle, our CJC staff. And the key findings from Kathy's study was that the deeper the investment, not only of the core members, but also of the volunteers, the better the return was for everyone involved. Um, just having sort of that surface, I'm gonna show up just for a week and do the minimum, got good results, but the deeper the connection was and the more that relationship morphed from semi-formal into genuinely developing a connection among the folks in the group, they got really good results. Um, Kathy also teaches us, or we learned that it really helped with the institutionalization. So we're looking at some folks who could have been incarcerated any 20 years plus, and they're coming out and have no idea how to reintegrate, maybe integrate, as I think I heard Robin say, back into the community. So COSA volunteers can walk with those folks and help them do everyday activities like, wow, I haven't been in a grocery store in a really long time and I'm completely overwhelmed, sensory overload. And the, the volunteers can spend time with core members reconnecting and just participating in the community, something that probation staff really doesn't have time to do and it's not really in their role. Um, another important lesson or another takeaway was that having the COSAs operate as a team was really important more than just that one-on-one -on -one mentoring approach, that by working, developing this cohesive unit together, they were able to develop a small community of support, not only for the core member, but also for the other team members and engage in reciprocal relationships. Uh, we also learned that the fact that COSA is voluntary is of critical importance. Uh, you know, we have core members realizing that these are volunteers who choose to spend their time. They're not paid by anyone to be here, but they're choosing to support someone as they reintegrate into the community. Uh, the other uh, factor worth mentioning here is that the um, COSAs seem to operate in a, a realm called long on support. So their, their emphasis doesn't necessarily uh, come around all the time to the accountability side of things, but they're here to support core members and help them navigate those bumps in the road. And that uh, what we know is reintegration promotes assistance from crime, and this uh, study gave us some great uh, sound bites, if you will. So one of it's you know I'm, I don't want to paraphrase what people have said, so I'm going to take the chance to read. And I think hearing it sort of makes you think about it more than just reading it off the page. So from a core member, what we heard was, I think they helped guide me on the path that I already knew that I wanted to take. I walked in and it was just like ordinary people. They're normal, everyday people. I feel I have connections that I didn't have before. A Costa volunteer says, uh, COSAs are people who are going to not see him as who he was, but who are willing to help him manifest his best self and are going to be dedicated to it 
and who are not going to abandon him. From a, another core member, I can't stress the fact that they're not getting paid for this. You know what I'm saying? So they're just out of the kindness of their heart. They didn't know who I was. And now, even when I'm done with this, I've got their phone numbers and can call them up anytime, even if it's just to talk at 10 o'clock at night or if I'm just having a rough time. And we've got from another volunteer. Ultimately, they're gonna be coming out. They're going to become members of our community. Do we want to try and break that cycle someplace and turn them into constructive, constructive tax paying members of society and people that we'd be proud to have for neighbors? And then one more from a core member. Yeah, I'm changed and I feel better about myself. I feel more confident that I can do what I need to do and achieve. It's a lot because of the COSA, because before I was just like, I'm just a nobody. Nobody really cares about me. You know, forget it. But now I actually can truly see there's people out there that do care for me and they care for me for who I am. Now I'll leave it there and turn over to my colleague, Derek. Thank you very much, Chris and Laura uh, and Robin uh, at the top of the program. So I'm just going to take a moment or two and just sort of spotlight a couple of key lessons that we've learned along our journey here that hopefully um, as uh, any of your jurisdictions are in any phase of embarking on this, um, this, could, this could, you know, be of help. So, you know, so one thing that's been clear to us is that uh, you know, we've got multiple program sites, but for any single one, having a point person, okay, within the gatekeeper organization, in other words, the referring organization, that's the Department of Corrections for us, um, that individual and who has that assigned role really needs to, on kind of a personal level, really understand and value and support COSA um, before trying to build all the capacity in terms of identifying and training volunteers and whatever kind of external service delivery model. Um, if it's just an assigned duty by the, you know, somebody, it, it really will probably not get the traction that this type of uh, work needs. Um, we have to really be vigilant and continually align any program development process or training materials, everything we're doing, bring it back to this overarching and foundational value of this is about no more victims. That seems obvious, but it actually takes a lot of intention because if you pause for a moment, if you think about it, everything we've been describing is about volunteers working with the offender and the victim of record is not involved in the COSA, um, intentionally so for the folks that uh, we wrap courses around. And that can lead to a myopic focus away from the victim. And so the circle coordinators really have to work on how is what's happening in the circle still in the spirit of ensuring that this person will not reoffend. Um, having really clear operational parameters between what the COSTA does and in our case we have this model where these community justice um, centers operate those and then the supervising agency um, being the Department of Corrections, having that really clear in any interorganizational relationship, having who's going to do what and what the uh, explicit expectations are, I think are very important because this is a partnership model. But like any good partnership, it um, is built on clear expect, mutual expectation and accountability of one another. Um, this is an ongoing struggle, but we learn this and learn this lesson again and again that, um, you know, threading the needle of release is tricky, especially with the population for whom COSAs are best indicated, high risk and high need, um, and housing um, as a particular uh, barrier is um, something that to the extent that uh, any site can troubleshoot beforehand so that you don't have one part of this operation training up volunteers and getting them ready and engaging them and then all of a sudden this person's just not coming out anytime. So trying to get all the pieces to sequence, including the housing, is something we've uh, come to really uh, value. And um, 
Robin uh, highlighted this earlier, but uh, this, the coordinator role is really critical. They are kind of the glue, I think, in many ways that binds the relationships that are in the COSA to the organizational supervision within DOC and having them present for us in our model at all of these meetings, they carry the responsibility of having the regular communication with the probation officer. Uh, they let the volunteers do what they can do and shoulder those other professional responsibilities that come with high integrity coordination of volunteers. Um, and that's been a really key takeaway for us. And I think um, the other quick things are thinking about what kind of qualities you want in your volunteers and how do you think you're going to find those folks um, and who can make that commitment um, in your community. Um, our justice centers, again, we can't sort of under, can't overstate their roles because they're locally based entities. So they're reaching in through their own social capital and connection to, um, uh, to find volunteers. Um, Resourcing, obviously, key. As I think you saw, we started with a series of federal grants and then showed through our qualitative and quantitative evaluation uh, the efficacy of this model and figured out multiple ways for the different audiences for whom this still um, resonates, how to tell that story. And we're, uh, we're an integrated department, which I think structurally is a lesson that for us um, has assisted in our ability to operationalize something like this across the Department of Corrections, too. So uh, we've got our contact information up. I'm going to quickly hand it over to David DeMore, who's going to take us home on this before questions and answers. So thank you very much for all your interest in this topic today. Thank you very much, um, Derek, Laura, Chris. Uh, today to discuss the current state of responding to individuals who have committed sexual violence, we have David DeMora, director of our special projects and um, also one of our senior advisors here at the CSG Justice Center. Um, David specializes in criminal, criminogenic risk and needs assessments and the intersection of mental health and criminal justice. His work spans CSG Justice Center projects related to risk assessment, recidivism reduction, transitional age youth, and law enforcement slash mental health. David's previous criminal justice and human services experience includes extensive work with adults and juveniles and individuals with developmental disabilities, substance use, mental illnesses, and or sexually violent behavior. He has co-authored scholarly articles, provided training for criminal justice and mental health practitioners, and has implemented programs for people with mental illness and behavioral health difficulties. And with that, I will now turn it over to David. Hello, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> very good to talk with all of you, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, Lahis and Keisha, there are, seems to be a bit of a technical problem at my end. You may need to move the couple of slides uh, for me, if you wouldn't mind. And, no problem. Uh, if you, thank you. And so if you would just move to the next slide, that would be great. Um, first of all, I'd really like to thank Robin, Derek, Chris, and Laura for joining us and for providing this webinar. I have known many of these folks for a long time and have and massively impressed with their commitment to both science and humanity. And that's sort of a key issue, I think, when we talk about COSA. Another key issue when we think about this is that Robin mentioned that COSA is really based on and consistent with the risk, need, and responsivity model. What I think Robin didn't say uh, directly, but that I want to really follow up on is that one of the things that COSA does so well is that it really takes into account the responsivity piece of risk needs and responsivity. So many treatment models today talk about following and utilizing R&R, but in fact they stop at bucketing people in a certain level of risk, and they don't move on to effectively consider what the variety of needs are, criminogenic and other needs, and how to best provide those services. So. Uh, when we think about that issue, I think that COSA is on so many levels a, a, a guide for us to really think about how to respond differently to folks, not just in a content way, but very much in a process and qualitative way. 
Now, the reality is, is that I started in this area about 40 years ago now. The people that we were arresting and convicting 40 years ago is, were radically different than the population that we have today. We still have those folks, but we actually have a much wider or more divergent group of individuals than we used to arrest and convict 40 years ago. Now, the good news about that, of course, is the fact is it's because we're so much more sensitive about the issue of sexual violence, because we are not willing to let folks get away with committing sexual violence, at least most of the time, and that we really pay close attention to what it is we need to do to uh, identify those folks, to arrest those folks, and, and to have those folks appropriately supervised and, treat, and treated. However, one of the problems is, is that we still have a tendency in a lot of ways in many areas of the country to provide supervision and treatment the same way that we were providing it 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, as if with the same population of folks uh, that we had then, we have today. In fact, we have a much wider variety of folks. We certainly have many folks who, where the primary driver is sexual deviancy. We also have many folks where the primary driver is uh, more general criminogenic kinds of issues. And we also have many folks who simply do the wrong thing, and as Robin was indicating earlier, they will not do that again. And yet we have a tendency to supervise folks pretty much in the same way. We have a tendency to, regardless of what the risk score is in many jurisdictions, to treat them all as high risk. And we have a tendency to provide the same type of treatment to everyone, often for very long periods of time, when in fact we know that treatment is effective for people who are moderate and high risk and will not lower the risk of those low risk individuals. Now the good news is, is that there are many quality treatment programs in this country. There are many excellent researchers in the United States and Canada and in other countries. We're fortunate to have ATSA as an association uh, and with a variety of researchers and, and other practitioners who really look to, if you will, push the envelope in terms of knowledge and to understand what we need to do. But by the same token, when we look across our country, both the availability of treatment and the quality of treatment varies pretty dramatically. Many sites still don't use evidence-based practices. Sometimes they just put together a variety of different workbooks and, and provide a lot of what is essentially psychoeducational work as opposed to really helping people learn pro-social uh, pro, uh, pro behaviors and practice those behaviors. There's a lot of reading back and forth, if you will, and relatively limited interaction and differences between how that treatment is provided. In other words, not much attention paid to responsivity and certainly not much attention uh, that is paid to the various types of relationship developments that you see as were discussed today about COSA. The other piece that is good news is that we do now have a number of curricula available and they, uh, they are either validated or in the process of being validated and are very useful components. The downside of that is that in many places, and you particularly see this in prison settings, that's all they do. And so they've stopped looking at the other pieces. They've stopped looking at the complex needs, and they simply provide 12, 24, 36, 48 week curricula, which indeed they should be doing, but it is not necessarily all that should happen. So we have some significant gaps uh, really at this point, and we also have uh, gaps in the fact that many programs don't focus on wider criminogenic factors but only focus on the sexual deviancy issues. And now for those folks who are indeed higher risk and who indeed do have greater issues related to sexual deviancy, we have a tendency to under-medicate folks. Uh, we, we don't have, uh, and what I mean by that is we don't have enough availability of medication for folks. And sometimes that's because of a shortage of folks to be able to prescribe that in a particular area. Sometimes it's because the program simply doesn't have that as a component of what they do. And yet, again, when we think about responsivity, it's not that in most instances, instances that medication will solve the problem, but that in fact it can help the other work that needs to happen be done so much more more effectively. Uh, Lahise, if you would please move the slide forward. Okay. 
one of the pieces that is really excellent news is that more and more states are looking at the efficacy of current treatment programs, both in their prison settings and in the community, and they're looking at the various practices, and they're really looking at two things. They're looking, one, to better utilize resources. Let's not give everybody everything and waste precious resources because we don't have enough of them to go around. Secondly, they're also looking at uh, the issue of what is it we're providing and, and who are we providing it to and what are the differences that need to happen. In some cases, this is the result of sex offender management boards in, in many states. In other states, there are not sex offender management boards, but the probation or parole or corrections or judicial departments, depending, are looking at these issues and really setting standards, both in terms of what they're doing internally and in terms of any folks that they might contract with or have lists, referral lists with in the community. And finally, the other, I think, important piece, and particularly important in light of Robin's comment earlier about the large number of young offenders, again, something that early on we did not see. We tended to see older offenders. We tended to see folks who were multiple offenders. We saw a lot of intrafamilial offenders. We saw a number of, of very violent offenders. But it was very different then, uh, and it's not that these other folks did not exist. It's that we didn't see them. We didn't pay attention to them, and we didn't really develop our response set based on those folks. And so now we have the situation where we have many, many young people who are clearly acting out. And in many jurisdictions, we have really treated them as mini-me adults. We have really responded with very similar types of treatment. Uh, in some cases, we've put them on the same registries that, are adult, that adults are on. In many cases, we still move them upstairs to the adult court system, when in fact we know that they are dramatically different individuals over and above the fact that the majority of them will not commit a crime, a sex crime after the age of 18 uh, or 20. The other issue is that just from a developmental perspective, they are so massively different that everything that we developed in terms of working with adults simply won't work with juveniles. And the fortunate piece of that is that more and more states are beginning to really seriously look at the science behind this and really look at how it is they need to better respond to this group of individuals. Whether they keep them in the adult system or not is one issue, but the second issue really is that whichever system they are in, states are really looking at having a very separate response set in terms of how they supervise and in terms of how they treat these individuals. Moving to the next slide, please, Lise. What we wanted to let everybody know is that very soon, the Council of State Governments Justice Center is pleased to be able to give folks a web page, a COSA web page that will be developed. It is actually currently uh, under review and final approval process with the Bureau of Justice Assistance. And so within a matter of just a few weeks, we should be able to have this up for folks. Uh, Dr. Wilson and others have spent m much, much time over the last year and a half developing the resources and the content for this, this page and for the material that will be on it. And so we're very happy that this will be available and invite all of you to check back uh, and see when it comes up in the next few weeks. We will be putting a notice out in our newsletter and on our web as well uh, to let folks know that it is live. And then finally, I want to mention that also within the next couple of months, in conjunction with CSOM, Center for Sex Offender Management, Dr. Kurt Bumby, we're putting out a document on housing for people who have committed sexual offenses and the challenges and issues and the kinds of things that jurisdictions can think about in terms of developing housing. And we're, we're probably between six and eight weeks before that will be released. That will also be put up on our website. And uh, again, we will put out a note and have a, a an announcement on our website letting folks know that, that is coming. And so with that, once again, on behalf of the Justice Center, I very much want to thank our panelists, Robin, Derek, Chris, and Laura, and appreciate uh, their good work over the many years and the way they are moving forward the COSA model and, and doing so with tremendous passion and commitment with, that we've been able to see firsthand in some of our visits. And so again, thanks to all of them for joining. And with that, I will turn this back over to Kesha and Lahiz for questions and answers. Thank you, David. Um, this concludes the presentation portion of the webinar. And with that, we will go ahead and answer questions. Um, please continue to enter your questions into the Q&A panel box and we'll get to them 
to as many as we can. Um, I will go ahead and start with a few that I've already gathered. Thank you everyone for being so, um, so active on the Q&A. Um, so for uh, Vermont DOC, um, a common theme in the questions being asked by the audience right now has been recruiting and vetting, um, sorry, recruiting, vetting, and training of volunteers. Derek, I know that you touched on this um, during your portion of the presentation. Uh, can the team discuss some of the strategies used by your team and or the community justice centers? Sure. Um, so I'll uh, say a couple things and then uh, turn it over to Chris and Laura to uh, complement anything I've left out. So um, as you'll recall, one of the slides Laura presented, she, uh, in the timeline, spoke about these, what were at the time called uh, reparative boards. Um, this was sort of uh, the Department of Corrections sort of initial step into really an ongoing uh, commitment and expanded uh, way of partnering with communities around uh, processes based on restorative justice principles. And so we had uh, statewide and continue to do statewide um, panels or boards, if you will, through these locally um, run community justice centers for community members volunteer um, to meet with folks who are responsible for low level offenses. So this is not about reentry, this is about misdemeanor level stuff. But I think we built a really strong base of civic engagement and involvement. And in fact, we had prior to that done a public survey, the Department of Corrections had that indicated very strongly that the public wanted to be involved. So we, we met the kind of broader opportunity for civic engagement on the sort of lowest risk end. And I think from that, when we started transitioning into reentry, we had sort of a built in cadre of folks across the state who could now better imagine how to apply those principles that they were on the low end with people now coming back. So I guess there was an iterative step to it that I think got us started. Maybe I'll turn it over to Chris and Laura to sort of take us forward from there. Um, so in addition to the network of volunteers that was already recruited by the Justice Centers, uh, they were embedded in the community uh, for a decade prior to us starting COSA. So our executive directors of our justice centers, as well as uh, the staff they hired to be reentry coordinators, uh, were heavily engaged in the community and had a number of connections. So targeted recruitment was really big at the beginning and continues to be a big piece of recruitment where uh, they leverage the social capital they have through the relationships they have with prominent members in the community and will directly pick up the phone or visit these, these folks and say, you know, we could really use you for this program. Uh, your experience, your uh, expertise, your uh, civic mindedness uh, is, is essential for this program to work. Would you consider being a volunteer? And there was a significant amount and continues to be of one-on-one -on -one recruitment. Uh, additionally, our uh, volunteer policies in Vermont Department of Corrections uh, doesn't preclude someone that's a facility volunteer uh, to also be a volunteer out in the community and work with people under supervision. So our volunteer coordinators that work both in the facility and the field um, relied on the volunteers they had working with this population on the inside uh, to continue to work with it on the outside. And then generally uh, the same types of recruitment through faith-based organizations, through community uh, networks, through um, online, through Front Porch Forum and uh, different community uh, websites have, have helped a little, but I would say the, the key recruitment is that one-on-one -on -one targeted recruitment by those that are uh, in, in the community, whether they're staff at the CJC or volunteers recruiting other volunteers. Uh, we have uh, uh, some volunteers that uh, are our best recruiters that we have. They just, everywhere they go, they talk about their, uh, generally about their experience and the value that COSA uh, has been in their life and encourage 
uh, other like-minded people to get involved as well. Yeah, I think Derek and Chris covered that really well. I mean, I, I'll draw the connection. Yes, Vermont is a small state with small communities, but I think really, just as Chris said, that one-on-one -on -one targeted ask from, we really need your help has been the most effective strategy. And two other things that occurred to me real quickly is, as you heard from Laura, you know, those quotes are really compelling. And I think when you have qualitative and quantitative data, that then you can also put in front of people and say, hey, how often is it that you can spend an hour or two a week and really make a direct critical difference in the safety of your community? That's a very compelling um, ask. And um, one of the things that Vermont is um, a little distinct around in terms of our COSA practices, as, you, as you've heard earlier, we don't limit the COSAs to only folks who've committed sexual offenses. And I do think that makes it more palatable, frankly, for some volunteers who would say, okay, I can wrap my head around this for somebody who's done, you know, this, but, you know, when it comes to sexual offenses, that's not, that's, that's not where I'm at, at least right now. So, you know, that sort of wider net, if you will, makes it a little advantageous on our volunteer recruitment perspective. Thank you for the question. And it's an ongoing challenge. We have, we have to keep working on it. Thank you very much. Um, another question, uh, Robin, um, for you and um, let me see here. How many states are currently implementing COSA in the U.S.? And can this model be used with any other um, population that does not have a sex offense? Okay, so, so let me take the last bit first. So there's no good reason to believe that this sort of in, intentional community model wouldn't work with any at-risk at population. And, and in fact, we have lots of different examples of that. Um, there are there are many you know kind of uh, many supportive models available for people with uh, with persistent mental illness, for people who have intellectual disabilities, for people who have cancer, who have you know, schizophrenia, all those sorts of things. And it's always been my perspective that if you have a problem that you want to change, that the best thing you can do is share that with someone else. And I think that's really what we're talking about here is that idea that there are people with issues who are sharing those, those issues with other people. In the end, the hope being that, uh, you, you know, that they're going to become more functional, won't have the same, uh, you know, experience of those problems, and that everyone becomes a better person as a consequence. So I don't see any reason why the COSA model wouldn't work with any at-risk population, and that certainly come up in some of the questions that I've been sort of slowly going through and trying to answer within that, that Q&A field. Um, the, the other question, sorry, can you remind me of the first part again? Sure, no problem. Um, so the second question, uh, sorry, the first question was how many states are implementing right. COSA right. in the U.S.? Okay, so, and, and I'm sure I'm going to forget somebody, but I'm going to try to go west to east. So we've got a well-established uh, uh, COSA project in Fresno, California. There are some other places in the state of California that are interested but I'm not aware of any offering circles at this point. State, state of Colorado has had COSA for a long time. They have um, a, a number of different variants on that theme, although most are, are very much in line with uh, you know, strong, strong community support sort of model, but, uh, but Colorado's been running circles for many years. Um, Washington State has toyed with the idea and has a few times tried to get it up and running. Uh, I'm not sure what the current uh, status is of that project. Um, there's certainly lots of interest, although I think they have difficulty getting it off the ground. Um, State of Nebraska was looking at, at doing circles, although I think their project is, uh, is uh, currently dormant. There are uh, people in the state of Illinois I was just talking to at the ATSA conference who are very interested. They have yet to run a circle as yet. State of, State of Minnesota, uh, has been doing circles for a long time. Uh, we talked about some of their research findings, so certainly Minnesota is up and running. Um, Portland, Oregon, sorry, forgot about Oregon, uh, had some money from the SMART office to run a circles project there. They were up and running for a couple or three years. 
I'm not sure of the status of their project at the moment. Their funding through SMART will end in the very near future, near future or already has ended, and I think that in some uh, sense has probably jeopardized that project. So I'm not sure of whether or not that's still ongoing at this point. Um, obviously, Vermont has circles and has had for a long time. Um, the state of North Carolina, Durham uh, COSA, has had, uh, uh, has had their project up and running for a good four, maybe even five years now, and I see that Drew Dahl is actually one of the people on this today, and Drew has done a wonderful job of building an excellent project in the city of Durham. Uh, Florida, from time to time, makes noise about wanting to have COSA, and you know, God knows what's happening with that. I've been here for almost 10 years, and I've been pretty singularly ineffective in, in building any circles groundswell here in this state. Um, uh, state of Michigan, also uh, very close to starting up a circles project. We've been there and done some training with them, and I think they're very interested, and uh, there's a project moving forward. And just one other thing to note, um, recently there's been a lot of discussion about sexual abuse in uh, kind of university and college settings. And there is a group called, called Campus PRISM, P-R-I-S-M, and I would encourage you to do a uh, you know, kind of quick Google search on that if you want to know more about it. But the idea there is that there's a, a possibility of also using the COSA model as a potential framework for those students who have been suspended because of sexually inappropriate conduct if they want to return to campus that using something COSA-esque may be helpful with those uh, folks as well. Um, I'm sure I've missed some site somewhere, and I apologize if you're uh, one of those sites that I didn't raise, but um, uh, I know there's been interest in the state of Massachusetts. There was a project in the state of Pennsylvania, although I think that one is now dormant as well. So, and it, just some of the reasons for that. Funding is a huge issue, and also getting the buy-in from all of the necessary stakeholder groups within a certain area also can be a really daunting task. Um, I think a lot of people misperceive COSA as a way to help offenders, and yes, we're absolutely doing that, but our goal through, through helping offenders is that they'll, they'll desist from being offenders and that they'll become you know, lawful citizens who add something to their respective communities instead of taking away. So that can often be one of the, uh, you know, one of the difficulties for us, just in terms of whether or not people understand what we're really about. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, hold on, uh, one second. Did he call? Um, there is another question. Um, for Robin or David, and right now we are working with David's um, sound to make sure that we can hear him, but uh, I'll ask the question, Robin, if you can start while we do that. Um, is the COSA frequency or intensity of involvement with the core member driven by risk assessment and supervision level? Um, for example, attempting to achieve fidelity and dosage um, of contact per through R&R, &R. sorry about that. Right, so um, the, the big answer to that would be yes, although how, how, uh, how sophisticated that process is will depend on the individual project. So there are some projects that are, that are very much grassroots oriented, meaning that they're very bottom up. So uh, driven largely by the community, populated by the community, and without necessarily having too much contact with the broader you know, kind of criminal justice system um, outside of, of, of there being, being representatives on the steering committee and then being part of that outer circle. So um, in Canada, many of the circle's projects grew from a need um, in the community where there wouldn't necessarily have been a formal link to the, to the broader CJC. Um, here in the United States, we tend to see a little more of the top-down approach in that many of the people who are in circles are still serving out you know, kind of probation or, or you know, maybe parole in some circumstances where there's a greater link to, to the formal you know, criminal justice system. Um, and in that, that sort, of, sort of dynamic, there's a lot more information about formal risk assessment. There's a lot more information about you know, kind of leveling, who's at what tier, that sort of thing. 
which would, uh, which would absolutely inform the circle process. Um, we very much want our core members to share what their issues are, where they have risk assessment reports or things that they can share with us, or where we can get uh, you know, you know, kind of release of information forms to get information directly from uh, you know, kind of, uh, probation, parole, corrections, whatever the case may be. All of that would be used to determine uh, both frequency of contact, um, at least initially, as well as what the focus of some of those contacts might be. Uh, Robin, can you hear me? Yep, I can. Uh, so I have, I have nothing to add to Robin's excellent response, but uh, I was trying to respond earlier and we had a technical problem. I'm not sure if you mentioned Colorado when you were talking about circles, um, I did. Robin. Uh, okay, and then the other thing that uh, is just happening in terms of interest is that Georgia uh, is exploring developing uh, a circles of support model as well, and uh, in fact recently visited uh, Vermont to look at the Vermont program. So that's another state that is uh, really looking to move forward with the model. Great. Thank you very much, David. Um, and we have two minutes left, so I will ask one uh, quick question that's left. So for um, Vermont DOC, just a quick question uh, is coming in about the general structure of, um, of a meeting for a COSA circle. Um, so what does that look like uh, in terms of um, how informal and what is being discussed? So uh, one of the one of the big pieces of the COSA meeting uh, is really establishing that common ground. So um, usually the core member as well as the other volunteers will discuss uh, what's been going on in their life in the past week, um, what's been positive, what's been negative. Um, uh, it'll it'll generally get more focused on the core members' uh, needs and issues. Uh, when the uh, volunteers hear something, um, uh, you know, they, they may either, if it's something positive, they'll celebrate that, uh, either uh, just verbally or they'll plan some type of celebration. Uh, if it's uh, something that um, uh, may seem like they need to dig a little more, they'll ask open-ended questions to find out uh, a little more detail on on what's happening in the core member's life. If there's a point where accountability needs to be done, they'll do that. And uh, so it, it's, uh, there's not a set script that our justice centers use. Uh, some do a very informal conversation. Some use uh, more of a, a circle process. Uh, some will use a combination of the two. And I'll let Derek speak a little more if he has anything to add to that. Well, I think that's it. I mean, you're really trying to normalize the type of um, informal authority that most of us are fortunate to have in our own lives. So our friends kind of give us a, a pat on the back when things are going well, and sometimes they give us a little uh, swift uh, kick uh, somewhere when they feel like it's in our best interest to kind of get our act together. And the circles really try to, um, you know, sort of emulate what, again, most of us uh, have the benefit from. I mean, I'm fond of uh, quoting uh, Dr. Wilson. Robin often says, core members are there to learn to share, too. So uh, at any given moment, a circle should have space for a volunteer to be saying, hey, this is what's going on for me, and, you know, work's been hard for me today. And um, one of, I think, the valuable things is when a core member is in a position to add value to someone else's life and not just be the recipient of everybody's concern-driven attention. Um, so uh, they really try to become as organic uh, space that mirror what friendships that have everybody's best interest in mind look like. I don't know, Laura, anything else? Yeah, I'd just add to that that COSA, although we, we talk about the circle and the month or the weekly meeting, COSA activities happen around the clock seven days a week. So part of this is building connection and having pro-social relationships with folks. So somebody who has very restrictive conditions of supervision may now be able, with permission from probation and parole, to participate in some community activities so that it goes beyond just that weekly meeting. It's now you have a network of support and accountability wrapped around you that allows you to re-engage in community life. 
Um, I would just add to that, just, uh, you know, just to say that the, that the formal structural structure of the circle is much more intensive at the beginning. And as the, you know, as the core member gets more in step with life in the community and as people get a little more used to one another and understand how things work, um, it naturally eases off. Um, when we initially started COSA way back in the 1990s, we thought, you know, that, that, you know, any given core member would be in the circle for a year or two, that he'd be fixed and he'd move on. In some cases, that, that indeed has been the case. Um, more often than not, however, we found that many of the people who are involved in circles really have alienated themselves by their behavior from pretty well anyone who ever would have wanted to share space with them to the extent that that for many of our core members, their volunteers become their family and friends. And that um, um, although, you know, it's not so much that it's a circle anymore, that those, those relationships persist. And it just sort of reminds me, um, when I did some of the first circles evaluation stuff, I went to see Charlie, the guy I showed you earlier on, and I, I sat and I talked with him and I said, so Charlie, tell me about your circle. And he said, I don't have a circle. And I said, what do you mean you don't have a circle? What about Harry? What about so-and-so? What about so-and-so? And he said, that's not my circle. Those are my friends. And I think that really was the point at which I got it, that these people were using the relationships they formed with their, with their circle volunteers to become the de facto family and friends that they lost over the years of offending and being incarcerated. Thank you very much, Robin, um, and Vermont team. Um, and thank you also, uh, I see our, our panelists are very active in the Q&A section trying to get to as many questions. I know that we weren't able to get to everything. As you can see on the screen, there is my contact information. The speakers have also shared their contact information. Feel free to contact us or um, contact me and then I will uh, relay the message. This um, presentation will be made available online within probably the next two weeks, um, and you will be able to, uh, um, to see everything there. If you have any questions, again, just feel free to reach out. And with that, thank you to our presenters, David, Robin, Derek, Laura, Chris, to BJA, to the National Reentry Resource Center, and most importantly, to the audience for joining us on this webinar. Thanks again, and have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye, folks. Bye. Thanks. All right, thank you very much.